So uh, my name is Tom Reynolds and I'm the president of the Reynolds Group and I will be your host for the next 45 minutes. Welcome to NextGen, a peer network founded 20 years ago to support manufacturing, distribution, tech and tech companies. <clears throat> Our mission is to help businesses adjust, leverage and grow. My background is manufacturing and I do soft and software development. I use that experience to do smarketing, which combines sales tactics with marketing deliverables to grow revenue for B2B companies. My business partner is Hema Day. She is a little late in getting here, but she does SEO to sales, which is a highly focused digital marketing formula. Helping me today is Linda Feinholz. She is a business growth strategist and a coach and a great friend. Uh, we welcome questions. Please throw them into chat, but with this number of people, just speak up. Don't worry about the chat part. Uh, um, our speaker today is Dave Garrett, VP of HW Engineering at Synet. Did I say that right? Synet? It's Sintin. 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 Thank you. Uh, his topic today is ultra uh, low powered machine learning at the edge of sound and voice. Uh, he has a long history in developing state of the art technology. He's also a good friend of my sister, Paula Golden, which is how we met. Um, she's a very talented person and I won't get into her background, but she's supposed to be here. So I don't know where she is. Um, uh, and I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself and the topic a little bit more, but at the end, I'm expecting him to talk about his Rubik's cube and his GoFundMe page and how he's creating a really smart programmable Rubik's cube. With that, awesome. uh, a recording of this will be up on my website, Reynolds Group Web. With that, it's up to Dave. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, Tom. And, you know, I've known his sister, Paula, for a long time. I was at Broadcom, which is a big semi semi semiconductor company. She ran the Broadcom Foundation, still does. Enthusiastic supporter for the, you know, STEM and education for, you know, kids at the middle school level and everything. And so I I've always will help Paula at any point in life. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, our company Sentient, and it's kind of play off the word sentient being, but, you know, we, uh, with every startup, you have to rename, uh, change the name of a common word just to get it through the you know, approvals. Anyway, Sentient is a, a, it's a startup here. We're based in Irvine. And when we look at ultra low power machine learning and at the edge is we're trying to bring this out to, you know, the devices that are distributed throughout the world. So just a quick background. I mean, again, so, you know, I've spent time in Silicon Valley. We're trying to be in Southern California, keep, you know, technology going. So we're a startup. We, we actually are being able to pull a lot of, you know, great employees from the Southern California area. We have schools, UCLA, USC, even UCI, and, uh, you know, Harvey Mudd College out in uh, the, the Valley. Um, that's our goal is to stay in Southern California because we love the place and, uh, you know, but we still want to do high tech. So we're a venture-backed company, 66 employees, and um, it's pretty interesting. Our median uh, experience is 20 years. So the middle, you know, the, the 33rd employee already has 20 years experience in the semiconductor space and, and software machine learning. So we've gotten a pretty experienced team that allows us to, to grow this company, you know, very quickly. Um, we've raised close to 65 million now. Just, we just closed our C round a couple months ago. And our you know, big investors, we have Intel Capital was the first one in. Uh, Microsoft was uh, the lead investor in the last round. We also have uh, Amazon Alexa Fund, Bosch, Applied Materials, and our financial VC, Atlantic Bridge. So we've been able to, you know, to pull in some pretty, you know, some key investors that are strategic and really help us on our path to you know, where we want to go. Um, you know, we've been selling products, um, you know, starting the company three years ago. We've also shipped production already by July 2018. And we've already shipped, uh, you know, close to 5 million parts out the door now. And you'll see some of those slides later, what we're talking about. Um, lots of cool awards. I mean, we're um, AI and machine learning is really a hot space. And hopefully you'll come away a little bit of this talk, understanding a little bit more what people talk about in machine learning. So we, you know, we really think about the intelligence of things. And, you know, I know everyone talks about the cloud and all of these servers and all the things that's happening in the cloud. But the reality is this movement to the cloud is not scalable at the end. And we're gonna have to put intelligence out at what we call the edge. So the edge would be, 
you know, your cameras in your, your house, the, you know, your watch, the things that monitor everything around your building. And there are trillions and trillions of, you know, uh, bits of data out there. And we're working on building machine learning at the edge so we can intercept that data and not, you know, have to send all of that through your internet connection back into some central point. So that's, you know, Sentient's, you know, goal is to put machine learning intercept the data and it gives us this privacy at the edge. So if we're processing your voice and we don't have to pass along the recording up to the edge, you know, up to the cloud, sorry, you, you have privacy. We can recognize words and not pass along everything else you're saying. You know, we have the reliability and the responsiveness. If you've ever lost your internet connection, um, I don't know, my kids, we lost it at the house, you know, a couple months ago. It's devastating now not to have a, a, an internet connection. So we're trying to change that to make sure there's a lot of processing still local. And of course, we're trying to put machine learning into form factors where the battery is important. So earbuds, you know, if you want this thing to do more amazing things, if it's happening on the device, you got to make sure that what we do is, you know, very efficient. So the idea, again, about this company is it started with, you know, processing voice at the edge, and you can kind of look at the user interface as it's evolved. And so you start back with the keyboard as you know, when the first, you know, computers and IBM PCs were coming out, you had a keyboard, um, you know, the mouse and the screen kind of evolved as the primary interface for a long, long time. And then, you know, the touchscreen burst onto the scene. And now that's primarily billions of people. That's the way that people interact with the compute. has been the touchscreen. And that, you know, that has revolutionized how you interact with your phone compared to the old, you know, T9 keyboards and such. But what we see, and Amazon has paved the way, is voice is really the interface of the future and how this goes upwards. So we, we talk about building um, you know, interfaces and using machine learning. You, know, you can go through this hierarchy where we have sensors and invent, event detection in our, our machine learning. What we're really selling today is wake words. So we can do super efficient, recognize keywords and you know, wake words for a device and do that so that you know, the battery is you know, can listen 24 hours a day, but still wait for this event. But as we build our company, what we're working towards is really, you know, more things about voice, so speaker identification, you know, and the holy grail that we're working towards is conversational artificial intelligence. So the same way that you talk to your Alexa in your home, we'll be able to put those types of constructs where your device is very intelligent. You can have a more natural language inter interaction. So this is, you know, the trajectory of our company, we're really sitting at the wake words and the command word space here. Um, we're building upwards and onwards just to be experts in voice. So, you know, the, the, the one thing I want you to take away from this thing is, you know, what is machine learning and how does it affect me? So the interesting thing is, I mean, this is a definition. I pulled this from the MIT Technology Review. And machine learning, when you boil it down, you know, just, just use the quote. Machine learning algorithms use statistic to find patterns in massive amounts of data. And data here encompassing lots of things, numbers, words, images, clicks, and what have you. If it can be digitally stored, it can be fed into a machine learning algorithm. And I'll tell you, this is really crazy because it does affect almost everything you touch today has been changed by machine learning. Um, you know, when you type into a Google search bar and you're starting to look for something and you see Google starting to add in the, the most likely words that you're going to use, that is a massive amount of machine learning that has been trained now to recognize what you're going to say. And really what machine learning has done is it's taken the expertise out of the, you know, the hands of an expert. So the old days, you would have an expert in, in personalities and language and someone will be trying to design an algorithm to see what you're going to say next. Machine learning has completely flipped that on its end, and it doesn't do it that way. It takes billions of transactions, and it's using just a massive amount of compute to find the patterns that make sense. And it turns out you no longer need experts in that particular field. You need experts in just building the training. So we flipped compute on its head, and we've turned something into more like we learn. It's like a baby teaching them to walk and speak and things like that. We're training these networks to you know, use this massive amounts of data. It's easier to attack problems, and it turns out it's way better at it.
So, you know, literally everything that you've seen in the last 10 years that's gotten better, any interface, interaction, is, is literally because machine learning has been deployed to do that. So when our company, what we're also trying to do is take machine learning and deploy that at the edge so we can train things to listen for words and we can do that, you know, locally now so we can boil that down into what we do. You know, again, the fully connected deep neural network. So what's the, you know, the idea behind me machine learning is again, you're not building specific networks to attack, you know, specific problems. You're building these generic fabrics that you can train. And I, you know, really the back in the sixties at Bell Laboratories was some of the first neural networks, you know, that can use to, you know, to, to run machine learning were really based on the brain. So if you take a look at it, the way the brain, you know, we think works, and I, I we probably barely scratched the surface, but you have, you know, billions of neurons and they're receiving messages on a whole series of interconnects from a lot of different, you know, places. And then you pass that along on this axon and this is going to pass on and it's going to have these branches that are going to connect to other neurons. So your brain is literally this massive interconnection of all of these things. And when you're learning, you're adapting how much fires on each one of these nodes and there's a total charge or you know, chemical action that decides who gets passed along these different messages. It's literally the same thing that our, you know, we do with our machine learning networks is we build you know, a massive matrix array of you know, unconditioned things. And then what we do is we're gonna train this with machine learning, we're gonna pass you know, hundreds of, you know, thousands, if not millions of samples through this of the things that we desire to happen and the things that we don't want to happen. And we can teach this thing to recognize it. I know it's very, very kind of abstract kind of thinking. Um, I just want to hammer it down. It's really about collecting the right data and asking and saying, this is positively what I'm looking for and doing that millions of times over. And we can train these things to do, to do these things. Now, let's get, you know, a little deep dive into audio feature extraction. You may be wondering, well, how do I teach a chip to listen to my voice? And so this is, um, you know, some interesting math behind how we run our wake word detection. So we can have a microphone that's listening live. And how do we actually teach a chip to listen to that? So this is an example of, you know, a time domain waveform. So this is when you say the word tree. And so there's going to be a tuh here in the beginning. And these are the, you know, the time domain waveforms. And this is like, you could represent this as how your speaker is going to travel. So it's pretty neat, you know, representation. You know, we can sample this with a, a digital device and we can represent what you've said. But what we do is we use this really, you know, interesting, you know, combination of math and uh, processing to boil that down into something the machine can hear. And so, you know, there's a, you know, Fourier is a very famous mathematician is the fast Fourier transform. And it's a way of compressing, you know, speech or signals into the, you know, the frequencies that are interesting. And then there's another person, Mel had designed, there was a scientist, you know, that designed the Mel scale. And this is how the human ear feels, hears. So what we do is we do a combination of frequency domain analysis, and then we break that down into the steps of what the human can hear and see what I've done is taken this, you know, very kind of dense waveform and I've compressed it down into a time and frequency component. And this is how the word tree is going to sound to our machine learning network. It's a really fascinating, you know, transform and it, you know, I can't, you know, I love the math behind this. It's, it's uh, interesting to me now that, it's something that we can now teach the network to listen for. So instead of, you know, trying to form an algorithm that looks at tree, we're going to feed this into the neural network and we're going to say, guess what? This is the word tree. And I want you to, you know, positively reinforce that. So whenever you see this kind of spectrum, I want you to, uh, you know, recognize the word tree. And then what we'll do is we'll take hundreds of different people and have them say the word tree. And you may say the word slightly different than I. You know, you could have a higher pitch voice, you could say it slightly slower. What the magic of machine learning is, is I'm gonna feed all the variants of the word tree 
in, and I'm going to say this network, I want you to recognize all of these things as the word tree. And it'll be much better, much more resilient because all of these things will be you know, trained to listen to that, that network. And then at the same time, we're going to say, hey, I, this is another word, some arbitrary word. I don't want you to respond to that. That's not the word tree. And so we'll teach it the negative case. Don't recognize that at the same time. So we do that on our machine, on our servers, you know, millions and millions of training instances. It gives us finally a network that says, hey, you said the word tree, and we can very reliably, you know, tell that to you. You mind a question? Yeah, absolutely. Please. Um, tell me what bins and frames are. Yeah, so frames, what we do is this represents about a second of audio. So frames are, we're going to grab about 512 samples from this time domain waveform. And we're going to do a spectrum analysis of that little, you know, step of a window. And then the bin index is the frequency components. So like middle C, I'm trying to remember the frequency, 400 hertz or something along those lines. Like we're breaking, you know, what was said in this window into the frequencies that were present. And then the last little piece is we do male scale. So we're going to take um, what it turns out is the human ear is very good at discerning low frequencies and it's less good at discerning higher frequencies. So we're going to compress the spectrum, which is say eight kilohertz to zero. And we're going to combine a bunch of the high frequency bins together and just represent that as energy. And so this is a frequency content over time and then we can analyze this whole thing single shot and say hey i guess the word tree was saying because the characteristics are very similar to this so i know this is a very deep technical talk so hopefully i'll get to some videos you know i'll show you some of the things in action okay thank you uh, yeah now again uh, well it's going to be more complicated but i want to show you some it's, this is interesting so this is um, very complicated math behind what we actually train, but it's a projection of how our neural network says, sees three words that are fed into the device. And so what I want you to take away is, I'll show you kind of how this thing has been very good at separating what each of these three words are said. And the words are different, they, they train differently, but you know, each person has said it multiple times. And I'll show you this projection. And it's really a, a weak attempt of showing what's actually really going on in the network. But you can see each of these clouds, each of these things, A, it's actually the, you know, hundreds of different people saying the word Alexa. And then this different color dot is a different word. And then this, uh, you know, this orange dot is a different word. Each of them has been fed through our neural network and the interesting thing is this space here in this 256 dimensional space is how we're easily able to say, oh, every single one of these is, someone said the word Alexa. And then I think all these gray ones are essentially all the other words out there. So we've trained this thing and this is kind of the, the net complicated result is how do you make a decision on these words? Well, it's extremely complicated. Machine learning had given us this ability to discern these words with these boundaries that no human could ever come up with. You never would be able to design this and we're able to do this with machine learning. And, you know, again, a lot of our, we have you know, two thirds of our company is actually machine learning and software scientists. A lot of the times we literally have no idea how it works. How do we detect that word? We don't know. We're results-based, we train it, we look at the response, we test it you know, with words, and we're building better systems that way. But you can say, how did it work? I, I, honestly, I couldn't tell you, you but we built the whole, frameworks. You've just given me a whole new appreciation for the Terminator. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I hope no one comes in the future to come back and you know, take us out if we're building these things now, but that's... Uh, So now, I mean, how, you know, lots of people are building machine learning. Our particular company's approach is to build this into these devices and use machine learning because it creates these awesome results. 
So we have our, our first product and it's called the Sentient Neural Decision Processor 100. And the idea is, here's on a penny, this is our semiconductor device. So this is a tiny little device. And what it does, it can sit there and listen 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It can connect to a microphone and wait for you to say these magic words. And, you know, at very, very small cost, we can provide a voice trigger interface to just about anything. And this is part, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, the semiconductor business. Once we've designed this chip, you know, the goal is to put, you know, tens of millions of these devices out in the field and build these into electronics that are very, you know, very, very cost effective. Somebody can create a brand new experience that they, you've never had before. And, you know, it's a fascinating thing where, you know, we've shipped, uh, we're now starting to ship, we've shipped 5 million of these devices out into a, a product that's about to launch. And we're bringing voice to a, a thing that never could have voice before. For this specific product, mm -hmm. someone's going to pick what the wake word is. This is not attempting to be a dictionary. It's not attempting to be conversational. It's just, what's the wake word? Do you recognize it? If that word is heard, wake up and let the signals and the rest of it happen. Exactly. That's exactly it. And that, this is the device that we say, pick the word. We actually have, um, you know, data brokers. We go get people to say the word over and over again. And then we have an army of interns that are listening to all those words and marking them as quality data. This is a good word. This is not background noise. And then we have a team that trains all that. And then we can sell this device that, that is listening for those words. And we can probably put, we can fit maybe close to 10 words is about the limit of what we can do. It's, but we can recognize 10 different words if we trained it that way. And so, you know, you can add a couple more command words, say, to a device. And Dave, does it output something like a mini uh, uh, microprocessor? In other words, you're triggering something, so it's got to have a control signal coming out. Yeah, that's right. So we have, um, it's a spy bus. So we're like a kind of like a peripheral and we can, we fire, we and interrupt. So we can tell somebody, hey, wake up and something's happened. And what's interesting is like in a phone, one of the first things we have been, we're built into a phone is the phone, you know, when your phone is awake and it's burning all kinds of power, you know, the battery dies quickly. Well, when you're not touching it, the phone is asleep. What we can do is we can keep your phone asleep and sitting there waiting for you to say the word. And then what we do is we trigger an event and we tell the phone, hey, something's interesting. You should wake up. We've said this word and it can launch these services. Okay. Now I'll show you a quick demo. So we have a, a development board and this is something where I hacked a Roomba, you know, a Roomba, those, uh, you know, vacuum cleaners, robot vacuum cleaners, they have a dev kit that you can take over control of it. So I'll show you this demo. And what we've hacked is uh, command words into Here's this Here's a Roomba. demo of our NDP1. So you can see this is our particular dev board. Our single device is sitting here and we have a couple microphones and this is just, you know, an engineering ability to touch these things. But you'll see this device, this tiny device is listening and then driving this vacuum around the office. 101 dev platform issuing commands to the Roomba create two. Left, right, go, right, 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 off, left, left. So, you know, pretty neat, like there's a lot of batteries and infrastructure, but, it, you know, go think back to that, um, you know, that device, that is really what's doing all the work in that particular uh, demo. You know, this, this is where we start getting into a deep dive into the chip. You know, this is, you know, when I take a look at the contents inside this device, you know, hundreds of millions of transistors, we can feed this, fit this into this device. And really though, what is deployed on a device is this deep neural network. So it's a fabric that we can program to recognize words. But you know, what's interesting again about machine learning is it's not always just for audio. So we can teach this thing and we've taught it to listen to 
like different sensors. So passive infrared is something, you know, that is used in security systems. Is somebody, you know, in the room. We've trained this to listen to passive infrared and do a better job of not triggering alarms. We've also, you know, trained this to recognize motion. So instead of listening to a microphone, there's things like accelerometer and gyro chips. There's these MEM sensors. We can train this to recognize gestures or motion in a machine, like a manufacturing machine is, is, has certain vibrations. You can train these devices with machine learning to say, hey, something is starting to go wrong you know, with the vibration of this device. And you can trigger, hey, somebody should take a look at this before this whole thing rips itself apart. So, you know, we as a company have really pushed the voice as our, as our main use case, but I mean, it's fascinating now that the fabric is you can train machine learning for just about any type of data and you can feed these through these devices. And again, think, think the size and cost, you can sprinkle, you know, hundreds of millions of these things throughout the environment to sense all of these things. So, so what you're saying is that if someone is in their office and I can get one of these chips in their office and they say, we need to build a new website, it would immediately awake and tell me to give them a call, right? That's right. That's right. Perfect. I love this and thing. Facebook I want a million tomorrow. This <laughs> Facebook can then target you on ads, and you'll have website ads in your uh, your browser after that. <laughs> Bummer. Um, you know, and then you know, I talked a little bit about the Raspberry Pi. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with this Raspberry Pi phenomenon. And it's actually, you know, it's a Broadcom engineer started it. It's a really phenomenal thing where he built this computer that's $35. And they've sold, I don't know, 30 million of those devices. And it's brought, you know, these computers, many computers to the world. And, and the interesting part of part that is we're able to leverage that infrastructure. So we can build these little mini computers. And we put this device on here, and this is our, you know, a little piece of silicon, but we're able to give these to customers and they can start playing with our device immediately. So, you know, you don't have to have, um, you know, a custom design and engineering board. We can just send you this device and you can speak at it and you can immediately get feedback and start playing around with algorithms. And, uh, you know, it's again, the craziest thing about the world today, like in any other time in my engineering career, so 25 years ago, you know, I'd spend $20,000 to go try and build something that wouldn't be nearly as good as this. And today for $35, I go on Amazon, I order this card and I immediately have a full computer that I can do all kinds of really amazing open source software development around our product. So we, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants now, and this is the, you know, the golden era of electronics. And there's some, you know, some key things about the open source environment that has helped, you know, companies like us build products much, much quicker with a smaller footprint. Is this same device um, similar to or compatible with other kinds of the devices we're seeing, like, you know, um, wearable clothing that's measuring your temperature or the sal salinity of your sweat or et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, for example, those devices have sensors and then they have connectivity to tell somebody the event are we you know we could easily fit in those types of devices wearables and you know all kinds of these smart fabrics and our job would be to stop you know the system from telling anybody anything until something really significant happens so the wearable you know your pulse ox like oh it's out of whack you know this is important we could be sitting there waiting for that event to happen and, and, and trigger those things Um, you know, we, we've gotten, um, what is, you know, Amazon Alexa certified. So we're, you know, certified to recognize the word Alexa. So you can build, you can build products that we could be the entry point into Amazon Alexa. And so like earbuds and, you know, you want an assistant in a battery powered device, you know, we've been certified by Amazon that we're, we're good enough to, you know, recognize their words. And it's pretty interesting. It's a tough thing to do because the requirement is, you know, for 24 hours, we're only allowed three false accepts. And so, you know, if the device says said the word was Alexa and it wasn't actually said that we get into trouble for that. And it actually costs Amazon dollars. You know, there's millions of people. Every time that triggers, it goes to the cloud, it would cost them. So we've been able to train this device so that, you know, three times a day, um, you know, some word triggers, but 
for, for the most part, we are accepting every time you say the word, we're going to trigger and, and pass that test. Has Apple um, approached you at all? Is Siri a... a so Amazon is interesting in that they open their ecosystem. They say, hey, I, anybody can come in and be certified on, on Alexa. So Apple is a much more closed system. So Siri, they control everything and they don't let you just arbitrarily train yourself. So you, you, know, you have to convince them that you are a preferred partner. And so we haven't, we haven't rolled that out to date. But it's neat that, you know, the engineering behind this. So this is our hats, our head and torso simulator. And, you know, surprisingly, this is like a $30,000 piece of equipment from Denmark. Um, it's used for cell phones and, you know, all kinds of audio where there's a speaker in the mouth. You know, we can put a microphone on the ear and we can mimic what a, a, a you know, a earbud would look like. And so this is how we, you know, simulate and, you know, validate our final solutions is we can, we can speak all these words, we can trigger and recognize, and this is we, you know, before we shipped our customers, our final networks, you know, we're in our lab running these analysis. Can, can this be used or will this, I suppose it will be, it's a silly question, but like if you've got a hearing impairment and you need a, um, some sort of implant, I mean, could it also trigger that and save battery life there? Yeah, absolutely. So, the, I mean, the hearing aids are definitely getting more and more intelligent and, you know, they, they are, you know, the opportunity to make it more interactive. And so, you know, you can use that to do words, to get commands, right? You can also start to use machine learning once we have processing in the year, you can start to do audio analysis and cleanup and maybe even each the speech, make the speech um, focus on who's speaking it to you and the background noise can be pushed away. So, it's, you know, it's a fascinating thing. Once you have machine learning, there's a lot that you can do. So I think, I mean, this actually, this is the video we showed before. We have some other demos. You know, one of the other ones I want to talk about, we work with Harvey Mudd College and, you know, over in Claremont. It's a really neat program. And, you know, I encourage you to, to, to reach out to those guys if you have any ideas to work with them. But they run this clinic team where they're fourth year graduate or undergraduates. Um, they put a team together to work on a project for a company. And so we engaged with them last year and we said, hey, what I want you to do is I want you to take our device, take it. I want you to go collect data, train something and do something interesting with the device. And so this is an exercise. Hey, I know we, our company can design for our devices. We want to make sure that anyone can use our devices and build their own use cases. So this Harvey Mudd team went and designed uh, their own network to take a look at motion and see if they can recognize gestures. And so they um, you know, took our devices, they took our Raspberry Pi development kit, and they started building something around an accelerator gyro. And they came up with, uh, you know, essentially a couple gestures that they wanted to use machine learning to detect. And so there's what you call the watch check, which is, you know, you lift your watch to your face and we should, hey, oh, that happened. Well, you know, maybe you want to flick a text away. So you rotate your wrist away or rotate your wrist towards you. And so they were able to go, you know, for this year long project, they collected 60,000 different training events. They went out into the, you know, the campus and they recorded these things and they got the training data that allowed them to train a neural network on our device that could be you know, almost 95% accuracy on recognizing these gestures. And I showed you how we listen to sound. You know, this is kind of what the machine sees for the acceleration. You can see someone lifting their wrist to check the watch. So this is how we validate some of the data. So it's neat. So now, now, you know, we kind of laid out, you know, what our vision is, is to, we're trying to, we sell the silicon to get those devices in there. But what we're really trying to do is put machine learning at the edge, you know, massive amounts of processing, but we're trying to intercept the data before it grows too large and has to spend too much time going out, you know, further up in the system. So, I mean, that, that's a, that's a summary of machine learning at, you know, at the edge, uh, you know, Maybe a deep, de deep technical dive, but I hope you hope you come away with a better appreciation of just how much machine learning is literally changing the world underneath you, and you don't see it, but you're seeing. You know, think of 
the difference in services and how well things are working from say five or 10 years ago, I mean, it really is all related to machine learning. No, I know what you're saying. This was, this was really great and, and mind blowing. I really appreciate um, it. Are there any questions that people want to ask? Turn off your microphones and ask a few questions. So people better speak up because I, as always, have more questions, but <laughs> John Thomas Thompson. No question. I, I have one quick comment, though. Uh, you, you know how they, they say that we are the, the average of the five people we hang around the most. I feel like I'm hurting the average today because you guys are really bringing me up. I, I learned a lot of fascinating words, and, and thank you for sharing. It's really cool. Great work, David. We enjoy, we enjoy this stuff, and, uh, you know, I love... I love, you know, teaching about it too. Yeah. This particular de device that you are showing, Dave, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know the full scope of your product offerings, but the one that you were kind of focusing on and that you used on the Raspberry Pi, I think it was recognizing like four or five words yep. for, the, for the Roomba. Yep. And um, um, what is, do I, do I have it right that the, the main kind of value proposition for this is that it, re, it, it recognizes voice in a very low um, um, current draining way so that you can, so that you can have a device that's battery powered, for example, that saves tons of energy be, because it turns on only when it needs to and it responds to your voice but it's a fairly simplified thing. And then, I, so my, I was wondering as you're talking, do you have ones that are, that are more sophisticated like you would see in, in an Alexa for device, for example? Yeah, that's right. And so we, I actually, I mean, we have, I mean, we're, we're three, only three years old and this device really was two years ago what we invented. Mm -hmm. And we definitely have newer, bigger, more you know, powerful products coming and we've got some devices in our lab and we've got some production devices coming. So we're, you know, that I showed you that hockey stick, like the onwards and upwards, we're trying to be experts in this, like you, you hit it on the head, exactly what we do. Yeah. Extremely low power for these couple words, but we'll also build a business about using more powerful machine learning to do more things, you know, more voice, more conversational side. So uh, you, you would probably have these comparative numbers, but let's say Tom, I think brought up um, hearing aids. And they're on some on state normally. Do you have any rough idea? I, would, I think yours are 100 and, 100 and, 140 milliwatts, right? Micro, yeah, we're 140 microwatts. Oh, okay, so, 0.14 milliwatts. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's and right. how does that compare to the, the off state or the, the standby state on hearing aids, for example? Some of those hearing aids, like the budget they have is maybe 500 microwatts. So 0.5 milliwatts would be where- That's know, a big there. improvement. Yeah. 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 That's a big improvement. That's you cool. Had a number of customers that are now using their products and product development where they're trying to apply them, or are you doing all the work and then trying to feed it to customers? So we have products that are going to start shipping. I mean, they're shipping now. They're in manufacturing. We've shipped 5 million parts and they are ramping in volume now. It's going to hit the market any day now. So and we help them do the words, but they've built this, the, you know, the phone around the device. Is it, is it um, low cost phones mostly that are being, that are using this now? Yeah, that's the first, that's the first, uh, you know, the big volume shipper. We've also put this into uh, MSI uh, gaming laptop. So the strangest mm -hmm. thing is we're super low power, We've put this into a high-end laptop, and, and the reason is our cost is so effective. So they're able to put voice into a laptop, which you wouldn't think needed battery life as a problem, but because we're so good at, at cost as well, we're doing those products. Um, what's the ballpark cost on just the chip? For, let's say, um, 10000 something like that. Yeah, it's a couple dollars. You know, it's not that much for these devices. So uh, two questions. One is I have a colleague who works for an Israeli tech company that is, um, as their consumer product over the last few years, it's, they've come out with hearing assistive devices. Mm -hmm. um, do you create strategic relationships directly with companies such as this, or there are intermediary steps for them seeking this kind of solution and you happen to be among the solutions out there? 
So we would go direct to, you know, anybody who wants to build something. And, you know, so this is the, you know, the, the, you focus on, you know, the biggest customers, that's what we would go do. So we, you know, happy, we introduce us and we can talk with them. I'd be happy to make the introduction. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Hopefully when we look at this whole topic of a consumer environment, you know, we all remember clap on, clap off. So the point is, I can envision walking into this device and the word on is in 15 devices and it's like a circus. So uh, clearly there's an additional word that has to be stuck in front of the word on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and then funny, you know, you can do that, like even um, what will happen is, let's say 15 devices are listening, there's some kind of coordination that you can also do in the back end. And, you know, even Amazon, like they can run Alexa commercials on your TV. And if you notice, it doesn't trigger your Alexa in the house before. So they build some smarts into the back end that, hey, you know what, even though I'm saying the word, um, it's from a commercial. I think I, by the I time you get- Alexa in my office, it was triggered several times during your talk. Right, right, right. Well, I, they don't know why I'm gonna say it, right? But when Amazon runs a commercial, they build stuff in there. Yeah. And then, you know, three devices, one of them will decide to answer because they coordinate. So that's, certainly the, you know, you can see the problem and you can see their solutions. And what, how many words will this current device, the NPD 100, recognize? So we, we could, we've put, you know, up to 10 words in there. And so okay. you can say 10 different words. And then, you know, at some point, though, if you're not, if you just say, I would just want to do one word, you could build super reliable one word. If you do 10 words, you know, you start saying, I can recognize all of them, but sometimes they're not as, you know, it's not as precise. Uh, I have a client who uh, does smart lighting for, you know, he has a contract for all the Google offices, although no one's going into the office anymore. But um, are you doing anything with smart, smart lighting systems? And because they do a lot of things with Internet of Things, or Internet of however you said it, intelligence of things, is that what you called IoT? Yeah, um, yeah that's right. The, um, so are you doing anything with lighting at all? So we would definitely talk to people about that. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, use cases I think this is really great for, but I don't have anything I'm shipping yet, but yeah. it's definitely- I'll, uh, I'll make an introduction there too. So. If you had an entree to Apple, what would you talk to about? So say that again? If you had an, if an entree to Apple, what are the kinds of things you talk to them about? Well, I mean, it's just machine learning at the edge. So the, you know, the AirPods recognize the word Siri. You know, we would try and we could build those things. You could build, you know, any of those the earbuds that they have would be a certainly a good place. And, you know, even a phone, we can try and save battery life. You know, if you have something you could send, my, my son is in charge of the IoT part of Apple. Mm, nice. So, so the new earbuds is his his product, and he's in charge of Apple TV. He's the he's on the hardware side of all of their stuff. Yeah, certainly. If you you know, send me the uh, we'll connect afterwards. I mean, you have my email here. Yeah, uh, I'll make sure everybody has everybody's email, so I'll get that out. Cool. Any yeah. other questions? You might. Uh, conclude our recording or include the uh, Rubik's Cube? <laughs> well, I, it's got to be part of it. I'm sorry. I want this to be part of the recording. So. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about Rubik's Cubes real quick. So this is a funny thing. This is my, uh, is my old boss at Broadcom. It was about four years ago. And we you know, were thinking, hey, we should build something fun. We built some things with Bluetooth. And we came across this idea. And we just started thinking of what we could, what we could build. And we built a smart Rubik's Cube. I don't know if I can, uh, I can show you this. So what we have, and we've launched this on Kickstarter, and we just literally closed the Kickstarter about three weeks ago. We raised $40,000, and we're getting this toy manufactured right now. In, uh, you know, it's at a toy distributor, and they're building 5,000 of these devices. Let's just see which video. So if you can see this, on every single one of these faces, we have a little light ring. And literally what you can do with this Rubik's Cube is you can sit this in your hand and you can scramble it. And then inside we have a little mini computer that exactly knows how to solve the cube and bring it back to the solved state. 
And so it's just fascinating. You can sing, you can see, um, no matter what you do, the 43 quintillion combinations, it's gonna walk you back to solve the cube. So, you know, we, uh, it's, it's a fascinating little thing because I literally as a kid, I never solved the cube. The first time I solved it is I wrote a computer program. So now, you know, it forms the basis of this. We've built this thing. It actually can communicate with a Raspberry Pi. And so we can teach kids about coding and the math behind the cube and they can actually interact with the device. And so that we're bringing this, uh, you know, the first prototypes are going to start shipping in December, January out to everyone. And we hope to go big with this at some point. That's um, cool. How much is it? Will it be we sell for? $59 right now. Wow. And does that include having the Raspberry computer? No. So you have to buy the Raspberry Pi your, you know, no yourself. But, you know, that the idea behind it is we kind of present the, the math of a cube in a very kind of simple way that, you know, we think middle schoolers could start to program this device and learn about coding. But, you know, really the most of the people, it's surprising how much joy it is having this thing solve itself. <laughs> because most people have never solved it, right? It is a <laughs> guilty. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, you know, I've actually, you know, the, we launched the Kickstarter. Um, it's crazy. We've talked to the speed cubers, right? Now, Netflix is a really cool show about, I think it's called Speed Cubers. There's a subset oh, yeah. of people that can do this in four seconds, right? And they're like, oh, this is cheating. You know, Rubik should sue you for, <laughs> you know, bringing this technology. Like, okay, please, that, that'd be great for us. But the other billion people in the world that tried and failed, like this is, you know, we can give you kind of that joy. And then it does teach you the patterns to solve the cube. If you do it over and over again, it's kind of muscle memory. You will learn to solve it. Huh. Interesting. I, so you, you were the one that coded it? Yeah. Dick? Yeah, that's right. So you had to figure it out, huh? I had to, I wrote some programs and I learned the patterns. You know, in, in the end, everyone tells you, oh, it's cheating. But reality, anyone who solves the cube has just memorized patterns. It's really, you know, the secret is memorizing these patterns. Years ago, my niece sent me, she was at Cal Poly, and she sent me this written list of here's the gestures. And I made it two thirds of the way down the list and went, I don't care. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> <laughs> but this, I would have fun. <laughs> right, right. And it's actually, I mean, it really is, it is super fun. And then the interesting thing, it's just like a GPS. So what you do is you start doing these patterns and you make a mistake. The thing is, the, the toy is so complicated, you're off in the weeds again. Well, this thing, if you make a mistake, it's gonna walk you back and keep you always solving it. So, so the, it's, it's is the light cool. telling you you should rotate around this axis? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll come back, I mean, so we'll show you this again. So you see how it's going clockwise yeah. or counterclockwise? You just follow those instructions. Oh, you, oh I get it, okay. And then, you know, the algorithms are start from the bottom and you work your way. So now two layers are solved. And then, you know, you're working, get the top level solved. <laughs> I need one of those. <laughs> so I have, a, I, I have a, I had not so much of a question for you because I'm always like machine learning is very interesting to me, but it's always interesting to me really to find out why it's of any value. And, uh, you know, turning on my Roomba is not, I'm sorry to say, um, one of the things that I really find valuable about, about machine learning where uh, I hear things that um, are better at uh, determining whether someone's broken a bone uh, from scanning uh, from scanning x-ray. But if you haven't already, there, you had a, a Danish device in there. I happen to be from Denmark. There's a, yeah. a fantastic book called Sense Making. It's uh, by a Danish guy. His name is Christian Mespia, but you'll see his name as Mads Bajerg. Uh, he's a co-founder of uh, Red Associates. And if you've ever seen an, an, a Lincoln ad with, uh, with Matthew McConaughey, uh -huh. that, that's yeah. uh, the reason Lincoln still exists is because uh, Red Associates went and told Ford how people interact with their luxury vehicles because they thought something completely different. Yeah. And, and compared to what is it, the Kia or the Hyundai eight-seater SUV that races around a muddy field, 
uh, I don't know who they're trying to market that car to, but sure as heck not soccer moms or whatever you want to call them who have, you know, who shuttle their kids around. Right. But it's, uh, it's a really interesting take on data and what he considers, what, what you're working with, he would consider thin data. Yep. And there's a great story about George Soros in there, which I see you making notes, so um, I won't blow the story for you, but anyone else on here, sense making, you have to buy it, you will want to read it more than once. It's but called was, sense making, Thomas? Yeah, sense making. Yeah. Yeah, and I, like, I, I, you know, we are literally just a very small slice of the machine learning that's going on. I mean, it is, it is affecting every aspect of your life has been changed by that. And, you know, it's pretty interesting to hear that use case. Like, Lincoln has probably saved itself just by, uh, you know, billions of data analysis points that makes better decisions than these, the old experts used to think. Well, well, in that case, it was the billions of data points plus some social science overlay by these excellent people at, at Red Associates because they, they the data and, and they, they determine why is, it, why is this data so important. Right. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you just briefly, I mean, the, the thing that they looked at was how do people actually interact with their cars and what they found, they did, they went and did, um, uh, just followed people around and, and saw, well, why are they, why are they so happy with this luxury car? Not, not what do they do? What are their activities? What are their actions? But why are those uh, actions important? And that's why, that's how Ford changed this, like the, the Lincoln Motor Company. They've got Matthew McConaughey. I'm like, oh, I'm hanging out with my friends. I'm just enjoying driving my car. I'm not right. racing my car around the damn muddy field because nobody does that. It's not important that you can do that. All right. Well, Dave, you are fabulous in every way. Thank you so much. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Next week, we're going to talk about the resilient organization. In these COVID times, I think resilience is a word that we all should uh, understand and, and understand how to become more of. So if you have time at lunch, join us and learn about the resilient organization. So, all right. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye.